My name is Alexis Hawk. Um, I am content strategist at a local marketing agency oh. called Greengate, um, but I also have a, a deep background in journalism. Um, and um, I'm really excited to be sitting here with this delightful panel of experts. Um, we're going to cover um, a lot of territory, um, including how to avoid um, burnout, which is, I think, as probably many of you know, a pretty rampant problem right now. Um, mental health, destigmatizing mental health, and making sure that mental health is a top priority, um, and uh, all kinds of uh, topics. So I'm going to let our panelists um, go one by one and introduce themselves and uh, what you do, and maybe a little bit about um, kind of your mission in your work. Thank you. Uh, my name is Obehi Ogumbayo. I work uh, here in Atlanta for Cox Enterprises, which is a uh, communications and automotive services company. Um, we definitely, as a company, do invest a lot in our um, employees, um, just health uh, and, and their mental health, because we know that a, a, an employee that is um, fully, uh, I don't know about fully, but an employee that gets to a point where they feel like they have a company that has their back, and not just their back when it comes to their career, but also in regards to their um, mental health, is definitely an employee that would be um, a successful one. Good morning, uh, David Kabaker. I'm with One Medical. And uh, for me, for mental health, I was thinking I just need to look at the whale sharks just swimming by <laughs> very slowly, very relaxing. Um, One Medical is a modern version of primary care. We're membership-based, uh, and we have over 70 offices now nationwide. We're very excited to be opening three in the Atlanta area here in 2020. And we work with over 6,000 companies, and we offer access to primary care, uh, really great access. We have beautiful offices. Uh, we also have virtual care 24-7 that is uh, free and included in our membership. So uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with mental health that I'm happy to share, um, but really happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Vicki Kanzler. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer at Piedmont Healthcare, uh, based here in Atlanta, but a presence all over the state. Uh, we have 11 hospitals, and probably, as we say, we've got about 600 front doors, which include our physician offices as well, across the state of Georgia with 23,000 employees. And I think when it comes to well-being, uh, when you're in healthcare, you're helping others get well, hopefully. Uh, but so at the same time, you know, we as an organization are mindful of the health of our employees through providing the tools that they may need to de-stress certain designs and provisions in our, in our health plan, as well as recognition. So we'll be talking a little more about that. Good morning. My name is Terry Hassel. I'm the Vice President of HR or HR Business Partner at Cisco Foods here in Atlanta. I've been here for about two years, and uh, one of the passions that I have is empowering associates. I think it's an employer's responsibility to ensure the success of the individuals that they lead. And uh, success isn't just in the tools and the, and the skill sets that they develop at work, but also in their happiness um, overall. So I, I have a very strong passion for empowering associates and um, love the Georgia area. Good morning. My name is Erica hutchins Co. I'm a partner in our Atlanta McKinsey office. I spend a lot of my time focused on healthcare work and leading our Center for Societal Benefit through healthcare. And through that center, we have the opportunity to spend a lot of energy on the topic of mental health. I also have had the opportunity to work closely with our professional development and human resources folks within McKinsey for our 30,000 employees globally to think about how are we promoting and supporting positive mental health. So look forward to the discussion this morning. Great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick poll of the audience, actually. Um, how many of you out there um, have, at one point or another in your career, experienced burnout? <laughs> wow. So yeah, so we all know, we're all on the same page here, what we're talking about. Um, so uh, you know, it comes as no surprise, a recent study showed that one in four employees experience burnout on a regular basis. 
Um, so I'm wondering for our panelists, can you speak to how do you combat burnout, um, especially during times when, you know, the, those busy times of the year, when there may be pressure from deadlines or there may be extra heavy workloads, um, what are some ways to mitigate that stress and make sure that your employees aren't getting burned out? I mean, I could speak for us at Cox. One of the um, ways that we do, and this is very passionate for me too, because I use it personally, we have a, um, a gym. At our, at our facility, and it's a huge gym. It's actually bigger than a lot of big box gyms that you would see um, on, on the side corners going on the way home. And something that Cox definitely does with the employees is make sure that there's no, I don't want to say stigma, but there's no, um, you, you're allowed to use it at any time. I mean, you would see people at the gym at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 7 a.m., depending on what their schedule is. And I know that when people have the ability to know that senior leaders or, um, encourages them to use a tool such as the gym to be able to help them um, get their exercise, which in turn helps with your mental health, is definitely um, is a good tool that our company have definitely put in place. And um, we have uh, they have people there who uh, can help you through. You know, use if you're an, uh, uh, if you're using a gym for the first time, they have a staff in there and towels and bathrooms, everything just to be able to make it as comfortable for you as possible. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, I mean, I don't know if you know um, anything about Cox. But we have a beautiful facility here in Atlanta, and we have a garden, and you would see people in the middle of the day having their meetings out in the garden, or taking a walk, or, or doing, some, uh, doing their uh, own personal work in, in the garden. So it's definitely, um, they've, Cox, um, as a family-owned company, um, have built a lot of tools and built a lot of things uh, for um, employees to be able to use and in turn help them with their day-to-day -day mental health. Great, so encouraging people to take breaks, um, for sure. Correct. Yeah, I was just gonna add, at One Medical, I mean, we're a healthcare company, we're also a tech company, we have about 1,800 employees, we're growing very fast, and one of the things that strikes me is our culture is an amazing way that we help people strike a balance. One thing we do is on a monthly basis, uh, probably about 150 of the kind of management level and up do what we call CI care rounds, where we spend a couple hours out in one of our clinics or one of our offices, and we spend it with providers, we shadow people at the front desk, we talk to patients, and our CEO is very committed to it. No matter what he's doing, he's always on. Uh, we're a video on all the time company, so there's a debrief where everybody's on, sharing out stories, and it's just a great monthly way to sort of remember what we're doing and why we're here, and I mean, in addition to taking breaks and doing all the other stuff, but. Connecting to purpose, I think, is a really important thing that I'm hearing more and more about. So. At Piedmont, uh, our purpose statement is to make a positive difference in every life we touch. Well, if we're going to make a positive difference, we've got to feel pretty positive, you know, about, our, about ourselves, about our environment. So some of the tools we do provide, um, we do have a team, because remember, we are dispersed, um, called Team Lavender and they do engage with either departments or executive teams and really teach them some of the fundamentals of stress management, stress reduction. Additionally, we have a real focus because it's not just a local problem but a national problem on physician burnout. A lot of that has to do um, with the pace but a lot of it has to do also with the transition to electronic medical records. And this is, a, this is across generations, uh, uh, the burnout is. So we do have a separate EAP for our physicians where they can engage physician to physician. <coughs> if they are struggling or having, having issues. And also, within various departments, work with them on scheduling, uh, et cetera. Well, at Cisco Atlanta, we, we do very similar things. We have a gym for our employees to use, although we, we restrict it to before or after work currently, but that's an idea to open it up. Um, great ideas from the panel already. <laughs> and uh, we also bring in a retired massage therapist, um, free of charge, the company pays for that. We bring him in and we welcome the employees to schedule an appointment with him. 
we try to have him in there in the afternoon through the early evening because that's when most of our employees are there. We are pretty much a 24 um, hour a day operation, so we have a lot of shifts starting or ending in the afternoon, early evening hours and that seems to really help. And then we, um, we also really encourage our employees to take part in our EAP program and the free counseling that it provides. Um, the, the one thing I would add is we try to ensure that we both have programs in place to enable people to have that needed source of renewal or to be able to take that break, but we also try to do things to lower the stigma around that to just make it more acceptable so people feel that they can actually raise their hand when they need some help before they reach the point of burnout. So one example would be uh, a program we have called Take Time that makes it easy to just pause and take however much time you might need. It might be more extended than a typical PTO and really pull back. Um, we also have been rolling out something called My Experience, which teaches kind of a toolkit around personal resilience and things that you can do yourself to ensure that you're renewing your energy every day. Great. Um, that leads me, actually, I, I wanted to specifically um, ask you um, in terms of, um, you know, mental health um, is, of course, um, it's a little bit more open. Uh, people are a little bit more empowered now to talk about mental health um, as an issue, um, but there's still certainly stigma around that. Um, so what are some ways, and, and you know, I know that you can talk about your research specifically in this area, but also for the rest of the panelists to think about um, how do you approach, address, and reduce the stigma around mental health? Sure. Um, I think you're right that, that it certainly is an important challenge to recognize. Some of your opening stats were really powerful just around burnout, and when we think about um, the prevalence of mental health and um, broader behavioral health challenges, one in five employed adults in the United States experiences a mental health issue in any given year, and one in 13 experiences an alcohol use disorder in any given year. So this is the same as thinking about, are we making sure that employees with diabetes or we're heading into flu season, any typical physical health condition, how are we treating it the right way? And with depression alone, um, someone who's an employee who has depression, they're gonna have twice as many missed work days and five times as much kind of drop in productive time, lost productive time, just because of what they're going through. And so think about what a difference it could make if you address that. I think stigma, when, when we look across the healthcare system in this country and think about what are some of the big challenges in behavioral health, one certainly is provider shortages. There's a challenge around ina inadequate reimbursements. Stigma is certainly a big one. Both a combination of kind of having the right literacy, so do people understand how to talk about uh, behavioral health needs and what it means, but um, getting rid of stigma. And I think um, there are a couple of things that we've honed in on that we think can really make a difference. And what's exciting is I feel like we're, we're very much at an inflection point as a country where the dialogue is increasing, especially among some of our younger generations. As a result, the expectations are that much higher that we do something. Um, there are, we've been doing some work with Shatterproof, a nonprofit organization focused on reducing the devastation that addiction causes families and designing an action plan to explicitly reduce stigma. So putting a lot of research into over the last 20 years, what were different social change movements that effectively lowered stigma? Think about HIV AIDS or cancer or tobacco and how can we learn from that? Um, so one action is around empowering through education. What training programs can be put in place, for example, so people know what conditions are, what signs to look for, understand that it's not a personal failure or weakness, it's actually a medical condition um, that can be treated. The second is affirming through language. So there's a lot that can be done just with words. So for example, we're working on establishing a language guide so we make sure that people know what words might be harmful or stigmatizing that perhaps had been unintended and what, what, you know, what to focus on and avoid. The, and, avoid. and then third, uh, around policies, so how do you really focus on parity, and as employers, what is the right checklist of both health benefit policies, but also corporate policies to ensure you have a supportive environment, and that just as if someone had to take medical leave for a physical condition, um, that you're offering equal support, um, and that can really help with burnout. And then um, the last one being around measuring, so with all of this stigma, how do you ensure that you're changing attitudes in such a way that it leads to um, changed behaviors and improved outcome? And so I think that there's been some growing effort across a lot of employers, including some on this panel, to make um, positive moves in that direction, which is really exciting. Great. Any further? Um, at, um, at Cisco Atlanta, 
um, I'm sorry, I'm struggling. <laughs> Um, as far as encouraging the employees, we, with employee assistance programs, I really think that a lot of employees don't understand the mass amount of information that's available in an employee assistance program. There's a stigma, as you said, that a lot of times an employee assistance program is just about mental health, and there's so much more to it. What we try to do at Cisco Atlanta is educate the employees about all of the benefits and the programs that are available through their EAP program as far as um, financial inst information, um, diet information, um, exercise, there's uh, legal documents. And if we, can, if we can push them towards the EAP program and educate them about what a benefit it is, then hopefully they'll accept it a little bit more and understand that the counseling, the mental health aspect is just another another part of the benefits that we cover. We want to really reduce the, the stigma on mental health problems there. Nice, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, this leads me to a, a couple questions, sort of a two-part question, but um, it's great to have all of these initiatives and programs that, and resources available, um, but, you know, obviously if employees don't know about them, um, so there's sort of a communication piece to make sure that employees know, number one, that this is available to them, and number two, it's okay for them to take advantage of it. Um, but so, I guess I'm also wondering, how do you instill sort of a sense of safety among employees, colleagues, staff, um, just when it comes to giving um, honest feedback and asking for help if they need? Because um, I know that sometimes there can be some reticence um, to, to even ask, okay, I, I'm struggling, what is there you know, that can help me? One of the tools that Cisco Atlanta has put into place is something called positive associate retention. We call it PAR. And it gives supervisors the tools to help open up that two-way communication as well as identify problems that they may be seeing in their employees and not recognizing. Um, different warning signs as far as maybe an outgoing employee that's shutting down, somebody that's usually very outgoing and they're, they're um, being more reclusive in the corner. Um, maybe they're showing violent tendencies or they're showing up late, calling off, off work more often, any of those types of things. We give the supervisors tools to help open up that communication with them, and um, it's actually been very, um, very successful. We've had two situations where supervisors, because of the enhanced relationship and trust that the PAR tools create, we've identified a couple of associates that were actually homeless, one driver and one warehouse associate. We identified um, through the supervisors and their communications that they were very, very much struggling and um, Cisco was able to provide them with some temporary assistance and help them get back on their feet. Most recently, we had an associate that was withdrawn, showing unusual um, tendencies, and the supervisor reached out to them, again, using the, the PAR communication tools, and we found out that they were um, considering some, some suicidal thoughts, which is terrifying for all of us. We were able to refer him to the EAP program, and as of Sunday, he was doing much better excuse me, with the free counseling. So although he's not out of the woods yet, it's definitely a win for now. And we're hoping that he continues to improve. So through those tools, we're um, trying to arm our supervisors with techniques to, to see some of the warning signs and communicate with the employees. Wow. With, uh, with the EAP, one of the things we have actually, and we're currently tossing it around, is you know, EAPs have been around for 30, 40 years. And is there a stigma with the name employee assistance? And we, we are, you know, in strong consideration of possibly calling it personal coaching. Um, but where I want to segue there is to, you know, to talk about there may be a lot of behaviors, a lot of mental health issues that the origin of them may be outside of the home. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, giving our leaders the training and the tools uh, to create the right environment internally. Um, at, at Piedmont, we have what's called a culture of safety. It's very, very important in healthcare that you create a safe environment for your patients but also for your employees. And the whole essence of it is, is speak up. I mean, if, if, a, if a clinician d was concerned about an action that a provider, a, a doctor took, then have the courage to speak up and not feel 
that they would be retaliated against. Don't get me wrong, we have to intervene every once in a while, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's creating that just culture so that employees can speak up about the environment as well. Uh, at One Medical, we really are working to help people understand that good primary care includes physical and mental health. Um, we started screening everybody that comes in for their annual ex health exam, which is what we're calling it instead of the annual physical, for a, a mood screen. And then if we catch something there, we elevate to another mood screen. And then if we catch something there, the PHQ-2 to the PHQ-9. And then, then we get to a call. And we've been able to um, really avoid, we think, some pretty significant uh, mental health issues. Uh, because of our model, our providers spend an average of 20 to 30 minutes with you uh, instead of 8 to 10. And so they get to a lot of the mental health issues. And we're trying to really eliminate the stigma by helping people understand that this is normal to be stressed. I think our top two, two of our top three diagnoses are anxiety and mild depression. And our providers, if you talk to them, will say that 100% of the patients have anxiety and mild depression. They might not come in talking about it, but they usually get to it. And we can also see that we can treat about 80% of what comes in the door through effective primary care who are all practicing at the top of their licensure and have more time to talk to you. We still refer to EAP. We can refer you out to a psychiatrist. Um, but that's a pretty startling stat. I'd say every single company I talk to has mental health as one of their top challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a bit of a stigma around access. I think there's a little bit of a frantic nature out there about the access problem and we're part of our view is that people don't need necessarily to they come in they spend eight minutes they get a prescription and they get referred to a therapist that they can't get into because it's a three-week wait time so that contributes to the anxiety people think oh i don't feel good i need to go to a therapist no you don't feel good maybe do a video visit with a your primary care person and just learn how to breathe or come to the aquarium and look at the whale sharks. Like it's, <laughs> it's not as bad. Anyway, so I know there's, there's a lot of point solutions out there, which people have said. I think our average uh, company we talk to has about 10. Mm -hmm. You know, a point solution would be like a virtual therapy or, you know, there's so many. It's, it's overwhelming to the employee. So simplifying and anyway, that's, that's our belief about it. Great. Um, so, you know, on top of these, um, you know, providing, um, having a, an increased awareness around mental health and providing these services, um, you know, the studies have also shown that um, work-life balance and having a sense of connectedness and meaning and feeling like your job really has a purpose and, you know, uh, fostering uh, community connections um, can also greatly contribute to work satisfaction. So, um, can you all... Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Obehi. Um, uh, what are some ways to foster that sense of purpose and connectedness in uh, work? Absolutely, this gets me really excited because as a company, um, we, we believe that we have to leave our gen you know, leave the world for the next generation. So our, our, our vision is to empower people today for the future generation. And when um, Jonathan was up here earlier talking about Habitat for Humanity and not just doing things just to do them, I got really excited because as a company, every employee gets 16 hours uh, to, do, to volunteer. And it doesn't have to be just, you know, we, we could do things with your team, which could be team building type uh, volunteer activities, but also uh, you could do something on your own in your local, uh, um, local um, community, whatever is passionate to you. And I mean, research does show that people that feel connected to their uh, communities and have that time to be able to do things like that are definitely a more engaged employee. Um, last year, we act, uh, as a company, the senior leadership actually took a look at our benefits and revamped it. And one of the things that they did look at was our uh, PTO. And um, actually all exempt level employees get what we have a flex time. Um, and you can take as much time as you need to go visit somewhere to learn about the whales. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but just making sure your job is done. So it's, it's giving employees that sense of 
one, you know, we're gonna give you the tools to be able to make sure that you take care of yourself um, and have that work-life balance with things like um, work from home opportunities if your job can allow for it, but also just having that time to give back to your community um, and giving you that time, and again, with no question asked. I mentioned our purpose earlier to transform healthcare for all. I mean, it's a, it's a great purpose, great vision. It, it, it comes out in all kinds of things we do every day. But as I was thinking about it, one, one thing I really like about what we do uh, in terms of how we communicate and interact, and we have 1,800 employees, which are maybe 400 in one office in San Francisco, 80 in New York, and then the rest are in our offices all across the country. And we have a policy where we're video on all the time on all of our meetings. And I've worked remotely probably for 15 years, and I love it, and it, it really connects you because you have to be engaged. Obviously, we all know when you're on conference calls and you're not looking, you're doing other <laughs> things. When you're video on all the time, you are focused and you're connected. And it's just, obviously it's investment, not everybody can do that, but it's something that we do. We make a really strong point about it. And uh, I think it really works to help us feel much more a sense of community. Part of, part of being a not-for-profit is giving back to the community. That is a, a requirement uh, that we have as, as a not-for-profit uh, organization. So, you know, our employees themselves, um, you know, feel a sense of purpose in giving back to the community. But we also encourage you know, they're being active in the organizations around which they have, you know, certainly passion. We too, in certain areas, have uh, flexible work arrangements and work at home, especially in some of our corporate uh, departments, which, you know, certainly promotes the connectivity. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, the connectivity that I really see across the system, because we are such a diverse organization, is through a lot of recognition, whether it be just spot recognition or some of our system-wide uh, programs where people are really recognized, where they are living our values and making a difference. That's great. Um, with Cisco Atlanta, we, we partner with several organizations, and I apologize, I'm only coming up with two in my head right now. But we partner with um, the, the food pantry, the, the kitchen mm -hmm. here in Atlanta, Atlanta, and the Atlanta Food Bank. Um, and there are at least three more that we partner with, and, and they're escaping me right now. But we um, put our employees through training if they're interested in doing volunteer work for any of the organizations that we uh, formally partner with. We put the employees through training so that they are um, prepared to deal with some of the situations that they may come into uh, experience. And then we have had to actually limit to make sure that productivity is done. We limit it to about 35 associates per week volunteering at one of those events. So um, it, we have um, sometimes a waiting list for employees to get involved. So it's been very successful for us. Um, and I would say that, especially on the point of purpose, that is really what's at the root of our Center for Societal Benefit through healthcare by focusing on underinvested areas that are critical to the benefit of society, mental health being one of those. Our goal is to be partnering with organizations to test and develop innovations with the explicit goal of sharing them broadly so others can replicate and scale them. Um, and I think that that certainly gives a lot of us um, purpose. And I think as it relates to kind of all of these comments and what can we do to keep our employees connected, if we think about the fact that over a third of somebody's life is likely going to be spent with an employer or working. The opportunity we have to make a difference not only in that level of engagement and connectivity of employees, but then what they take home to their families and then what they put in place into the communities that we all live in is really an exciting opportunity. Nice. Um, yeah, I was wondering actually if, if you all had um, sort of some metrics or some ways of, of measuring um, the effects of increased work-life balance or, you know, just uh, are, there, are there some ways that you measure success in these areas that you can share with us? We do every year a global survey that everyone across the firm takes and it's our firm people survey and it includes a number of different metrics that try to get at 
um, kind of underlying um, enthusiasm, level of energy, connectivity, you know, whether or not people have the right level of sponsors or mentors in their job. And we also have a question on there that directly gets at the level of stigma too. So we make sure that any programs that we're putting in place, we understand if we're making a difference and moving the needle in terms of really reducing the stigma that exists. We also have an annual survey, we call it Cisco Speaks, mm -hmm. and gives the employees an opportunity to grade management and the company and our programs, as well as um, attach some narrative to the end of it. I like the narratives because it gives a little bit more color rather than just a grade, it gives some of the employee ideas. So we measure um, employee engagement, employee enablement, as well as uh, supervisor effectiveness with that. Uh, so that's more of a formal program on a day-to-day -day measure. I think it's um, the uh, call-outs, the number of people that don't show up, that's a negative factor. Other than that, it's laughter in the office, it's people engaging um, and enjoying their work. So sort of a, a laugh-o-meter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want one of those. <laughs> Um, you know, another um, piece of employee satisfaction can also be the, um, the knowledge that they have room to grow and that they can really take their career and, you know, go uh, as high as they want with it, with a company. Um, and that's part of, you know, investing in your um, staff, your employees, is instilling that knowledge. So what are some uh, in innovative ways that um, you are uh, using to ensure career growth and opportunities that, that are available to employees? I mean... For someone who is in talent acquisition, right, you, it's, that's the first question that is always being asked. Um, I don't know, I think I shared it earlier, uh, myself and my team, we do the recruiting for, to bring in the executives into the company. So that's always the first question that a candidate would ask. So uh, some of the tools that we have, we have, again, several tools in, uh, uh, that the panel before had shared. Um, uh, but one of the things that we do have is just making sure that um, the, the, not just saying, oh, having on paper, you, you know, we have succession, pl uh, succession planning, but we have a, um, I'm trying to forget them, I'm trying to remember the name, but like an education center. So we have uh, a website that has all these classes and that people can go ahead and, and take the classes to be able to uh, make the, uh, get themselves better. Um, part of your, um, when you are doing your, um, for the year, your goals for the year is to make sure that you, are, part of the plan is to make sure that you have a time spent away from your desk, which is actually for me here, that was what I'm doing here today, <laughs> is getting myself um, educated and empowered and, and finding out what's going on in, in um, my area of study. So that's definitely something that we, we promote with our, with our, um, with our employees. Great. Uh, we do an amazing job at One Medical of promoting from within. Uh, if anybody knows people in the Atlanta market, I think we're, we're hiring. <laughs> uh, we have a very flat model, uh, as I've described, our providers. They actually greet you in the waiting room. They clean the room. They do your vitals. Uh, there's front desk admins, and then we have in-office labs in every office. And so very often we hire the admins, and they're really hospitality people. So they're there to welcome you. They're never answering the phone. They're doing some advocacy. So it's a pretty hands-on, customer-oriented job. A lot of them go on to become phlebotomists, phlebs we call them, um, which actually is one of our number one rated customer satisfaction area, which is amazing, because they're giving shots and taking blood. Um, and then very often they move on to be district managers, and so we have a lot of that kind of growth within One Medical. Um, and again, I, it's from our very flat, everybody's a team when you're in one of our offices. Uh, there's very little ego, um, again, sort of trying to take what's great about the healthcare system and, uh, again, a lot of opportunity within our, our company. I think at Piedmont, because um, in the past few years, and actually the recent past, we have grown incredibly uh, through affiliation and acquisition. So, obviously, when those transactions happen, you're going to inherit sometimes disparate type systems. So you want to bring them together uh, with the same goal. Um, as everyone on the stage, yes, we have uh, tools and we have talent reviews, succession planning. We have a menu of, of leadership development opportunities, which is a path depending on the level. Uh, we've also got clinical opportunities for, uh, for our clinical staff. Uh, so 
so it, but, but it really, really varies. And like I said, has been a real challenge, a very positive challenge for us to bring these programs together. Um, similarly to what the, the panel has indicated, we have annual reviews as well, quarterly check-ins as we also have. Um, one of the things that I find very useful is something called an individual development program. And with that, it's the associate. Instead of the annual review where the company says, this, these are your goals, this is what you'll accomplish this year, the individual development program or individual development plan, IDP is what we call it, the employee is telling the employer, this is what I want. This is the career path that I want. These are the areas I'm interested in. And the employee identifies their strengths, their weaknesses, and then they work collaboratively to identify different um, tasks, maybe different programs the employee can get involved with. We also, like Obehi mentioned, we have a Cisco Interactive University, or SIU. We definitely like our acronyms at Cisco. <laughs> so we have a SIU where the employees can take additional courses um, training programs and work with the individual development program to advance their career and um, get the right training that they need, the right visibility, so that others in promot promotion um, decision-making positions can see them. Um, would, would echo a lot of what's already been raised, I think certainly on the training and both kind of required trainings at different points to ensure people know about opportunities, but open access for if you want to be getting up to speed on a different skill set. And then I think just having, um, fully embracing the fact that it isn't a one size fits all and, and we've really increased our experience hires and hiring from diverse backgrounds and the number of paths at the firm, whether it be a traditional consultant to a wide range of different expert tracks and um, making sure that people, to, to your point, really embrace the what do I want and what do I want my personal path and there is no right answer that they have to follow but they can kind of do things at their own pace and shape it on their own. Thank you. Uh, so we have about uh, three and a half minutes. Um, so just to wrap up, um, since I know that uh, there's a lot of leadership represented in this audience right now, um, just speaking from personal experience um, for each of you, what is um, the top tool um, that you rely on in order to be mindful about leadership, to foster mindful leadership? Any takeaways? <laughs> sure, I'm happy to go first. Um, for mindful leadership, I would say when I think about me personally, um, the topic of mental health is critically important to me for a range of personal and professional reasons. And I think anything that I can be doing um, as an individual or as a leader of my firm to raise awareness to that, I think that um, will, will incredibly enhance my ability to be a mindful leader um, by being cognizant of that and by making others feel comfortable to discuss that topic and hopefully being an example to raise the dialogue with other employers. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, mindful leadership, um, I'm gonna go back to what I said at the very beginning and, and my passion is to em empower employees. And the way in which you do that is um, you get, need to get to know them. You need to connect with them. You need to let them know that you're, you're human, you make mistakes. We all fall down and skin our knees and employees need to understand that that's okay. That's how we learn. Um, I, have a, I've, I read it on a um, piece of paper once that you, our employees don't fail, they learn or they succeed. And I like that. I think that um, you need to let employees know that it's okay to fall down and skin your knees once in a while. And when they trust you and you um, give them that sense of empowerment, they'll come to you more often with any concerns. And, and to me, that's leadership. Mm -hmm. I think it's building, building the trust, uh, just to piggyback on that. And, and also, it's, it's getting to know your teams and also your, your peers. Uh, as well to be a to be a mindful leader, but also living a sense of balance. I like to cook, <laughs> and I can, you know, just really, really know when I am in the kitchen. That is my laboratory there for a while, <laughs> and it just really increases my level of awareness. In the kitchen, I do fall down and skin my knee <laughs> quite a few times, but but you know just working towards a great outcome uh, we have a tool at one medical i mentioned it earlier ci care and it's how we interact with patients uh, members it's also how we interact with everybody at work and it stands for connect 
uh, wait, CI, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Connect, introduce, communicate, ask for permission, respond, and exit. And it's a very sort of building block method of having an interaction, whether you're walking around the office or you're seeing a member and a patient, and we focus on it every month in rounds. Uh, but so it's an effective tool to, to make this sort of interaction thoughtful and have a good way to enter, be engaged. When you're in our offices, you'll see everybody's kind of heads up, looking in your eyes, not looking at their phones. I mean, you will see that once in a while, but it's a very engaged population. So anyway, it's a tool that I try to use when I'm trying to think about an interaction or a group or leading just kind of every day. Okay. And uh, for me personally, uh, to be a mindful leader, I know anytime I inherit or get a new team, I always, my first conversations with them is, I understand you're a recruiter or I understand you or whatever your role is, but you're more than that. You're a mom, you're a wife, you're a sister, you're a mom, you know, whatever role you play outside of the workplace and how can I help support you because the way I can help support you in those roles will make you a better worker. And then for me personally, I know I talked about the gym and I don't know if you knew, got that excitement as I was saying it. That's something that I use for me personally. As you were saying, you were, you know, you, you skin your knees in the kitchen. I do the same thing. I make sure for me to be able to uh, be a mindful leader and to be uh, an engaged leader and to be a good worker, that's a place I have to do that for myself. Uh, to be able to be a good wife, mother, worker, and every, all, the, all the roles that we all play. So, that's okay. And I'm glad that Cox gives me that opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's have a round of applause for this wonderful um, panel. It's been a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, I hope that you all have took away a, a number of uh, tools and techniques and um, that, you're, that we're all instilled with confidence that we can all have moments where we fall and skin our knees. And that's what we do. <laughs> so thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.